Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Freely Nourish, the podcast that empowers you to break the cycle of dieting by teaching you to nourish your bodies well. I am your host, registered dietitian, Erin Casey, and I'm also the owner of New You Nutrition Counseling, where we believe that you can reach your ideal health goals at just about any body size. So if you are ready to let go of the toxic and shameful cycle that is dieting and step into a world of nourishment that feels good and sustainable for you, then I implore you to join us. How can you join us? Well, you have multiple options. There is our one-on-one counseling, which has been available from the very get-go. Um, that is where you sit down with me one-on-one and we talk about kind of what your health goals are and what you can slash should do nutritionally to help meet them. There are some limitations on that. I'm only able to practice in certain states and what have you. Um, you also may not be ready to dive like full force into that. And I get it. It's expensive, right? So if that is an option you're considering, but you're not sure, I encourage Encourage you to book a discovery call. Uh, the discovery call literally just gives us a chance to sit down, kind of go through what your goals are, talk a little bit about our practice, what the process looks like, what may or may not be realistic for you, and honestly, whether or not your goals and my practice align. Um, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. That's totally okay. It doesn't mean you're wrong in any of your goals. It just means that um, that, you know, we, we just have different ideologies and that's okay. Um, but the discovery call is completely free. It's not laden with any pressure, any marketing, anything like that. It's truly a no pressure. Just let me know what you're wanting. And I will tell you if it's something I can provide. And then even if it is, you may decide you still don't want it and that's okay. Um, the other way to join us is through our membership program, which is called the cauldron. The cauldron is, um, it's a group program. Like I mentioned, it gives you access to three things. So the first is monthly cauldron calls is what they're called. It's just basically a big group Zoom call that we have once a month. Um, those calls are recorded um, so that even if you can't attend them live, you can listen in later on in the month. And uh, you also have access to a group Facebook. Um, it is a private Facebook group. So only people who are Cauldron members can have access to it. And it is basically just both the calls and the Facebook group are just options, opportunities for you to interact with me. There are opportunities for you to vent any frustrations or struggles that you're going through, celebrate any wins that, you know, maybe aren't as popular or as normalized in other aspects of your life. Many of us kind of doing this anti-diet, um, weight-inclusive work find that we are going against the grain in many other circles in our life. Um, so we may have circles at work or in our family or even amongst friends who, people who are actively trying to kind of shrink their bodies and talking about that and normalizing that. And we want a space where that is not the norm. Uh, and that's exactly what the cauldron is designed to provide you. It's, it's a bunch of like-minded folks um, and it's, it's an opportunity opportunity to kind of get feedback and, and, and share your, your frustrations in, in living in a diet culture late in society. Um, the other thing you get is access to four workshops per calendar year. So right now, as I am releasing this, it is kind of the middle of 2023. And so because it is the middle of the year and we just started, you will actually only get two workshops between now and the end of the year. So one is actually coming up at this point, it's next month. So it's coming up in June. It's going to be on June 25th. Um, it will be probably about two hours or so. I haven't quite finished the details yet. Um, more details on that to come. It, if you are listening to this later, you may the website may have all the information updated and what have you. Um, but all of that will be laid out for you. Uh, you will, um, you know, the, the first, the first workshop is going to be basically a start to finish. How do I take kind of the conception of meals? How do I formulate the conception of meals? How do I take that to the grocery store? How do I buy the ingredients and how do I prep the ingredients so that I am nourished throughout the week? It doesn't, it's going to take many different modalities. So for some people that might mean, you know, prepping everything on a Sunday for some people that might just mean chopping up vegetables. So they're ready to go later in the week. There's not a right and wrong. As you will see, there's like many different ways to go about that. And it's truly just a matter of finding what works for you. Um, but I will walk you through 
through the steps on kind of how to do that, how to assess if it's working, um, different ideas, tips, suggestions, all kinds of good stuff. So that is probably like hands down the thing I get requested the most. So that's what we're starting out with. Um, and then the, the workshops will then kind of just go on by request. The, the topics will be by request. So if you want input on what the topics will be, join the cauldron. Um, you will you will absolutely not only get access to them, but you will also um, have have input into what they what they contain. Um, the workshops will also be available to the public to purchase. So if you don't want to join any of the group stuff, but the workshop sounds like something that's interested to you, um, again, I will link all of that stuff on my website. Keep you know kind of pulling it up as as things go. We will we will update them. Like I said, the first one's going to be July. I'm sorry, June 25th. The second one will be sometime in September. Kind of date, time, all that to be determined at this point. Um, but all of my socials and all that kind of stuff will, will reflect when, when and when and where it will be, that kind of thing. Um, let's see. Um, oh, the specials on the cauldron. That was the other thing I was supposed to mention. So again, right now it is the middle of 2023 because we are in the middle of the year. Um, we, you get a discount because there will only be two uh, workshops from now until the end of 2023, then starting in 2024, you will get four per calendar year. You still get four per calendar year, but I'm kind of cutting everybody a deal to kind of build up the, um, build up the membership. So right now it is just $50 to join for the rest of 2023. Um, again, that is as of today, as I am recording this, that is subject to change depending on when you are actually listening to this podcast. Um, but again, right now, $50 flat, not $50 a month, all that good fun stuff. It is $50 period for the rest of 2023. You get access to the calls, you get access to the Facebook group, and you get two workshops all for $50. Um, so it is, it is a steal to be honest with you. <laughs> It's, it's a really, really good deal. Um, and it, it will increase in 2020. And honestly, it'll probably increase in three months. Um, so in 2024, it's definitely going up and it'll probably increase as we get closer to 2024. So if you're interested, if this is kind of the member, this is the, the way into new year nutrition that you've been waiting for, like this is your time. Um, join us, join us for sure. Um, and so with that all said, for today's topic, I want to talk about something that is honestly, sometimes a little bit taboo and a little bit dicey. Um, so I want to preface all of this by saying that my intention with this podcast is to present evidence as I have read and as I have seen it. Um, as you all I would hope by now know that um, the research I do is is second to none. I, you know, it's, it's all validated sources. It's all, you know, clinical trials, you know, peer reviewed articles, that kind of stuff. Um, that said, I don't want any of that to invalidate anyone's lived experience because even the best completed and best laid research still has limitations and it still cannot account for or explain everything. Um, it, it, it's flawed. All of it is flawed to some extent. So as we are listening to this, I certainly don't want to one, make anyone feel as though their lived experience is not true or is not valid or that I think that I'm simply kind of speaking to the generation or sorry, the generational, the general trends that we see in the kind of population wide research, um, there are going to be exceptions to every rule and there are going to be nuanced aspects to every rule. Um, that said, if some of this kind of sits icky with you, I encourage you to tell me why. Um, I, I, I would truly welcome that discussion because frankly, this is something that we don't know enough about. Um, and the types of discussions, you know, as I present this to you, hearing from people is what drives research. Um, so I would love to hear kind of what your thoughts are on it, whether you are, if you're comfortable sharing that in a public comment, that's wonderful. Um, if not, all of my information is, I'll link it down below. Like you are welcome to contact me directly. I'm, I'm perfectly happy to hear that. And, and I'm happy to have a respectful conversation with you about it. Um, I'm not going to tolerate any of the like, do your research crowd, but I will <laughs> by all means, you know, if you say, Hey, this kind of contradicts, or this is my experience, um, I will, I will gladly, or, Hey, I found this other body of research have you you know did you consider this um, I'm happy to have those conversations I am by no means under the impression that I am explicitly right again this is the research as it stands today um, you know two or three years from now even this may be obsolete and and there may be new research that comes out and and totally changes everything um, but again I am nothing if not adaptable so again 
not trying to invalidate anyone's experience. I know this is a touchy subject, but um, I think I think it's worth discussing because I think there is so much fear mongering around sugar um, that it, it needs to be said. Um, so addiction to sugar. Um, so I want to be explicitly clear that also today I'm talking about addiction to sugar explicitly, not generalized food addiction. Um, I feel that those are two very different phenomena. And in my opinion, uh, based on the research, food addiction is real. Sugar addiction is not. Um, I do believe that there is something beyond just binge eating that does go into addictive type behavior when it comes to food. That said, I don't feel as though, and this is based on research. This is also based on kind of my you know, anecdotal evidence that I've gained in clinical practice. Um, anyone who would classify themselves as a food addict, although they may have foods that are more problematic than others, I don't believe that there's ever going to be one specific nutrient that is more addictive than others. Uh, I think where people have different issues with different types of foods, we can't draw general consensus on that. I think it's generally, it's very individualized. Um, so I want to, I want to be very clear on that. And I also want to be clear on the fact that addiction is not the same thing as chemical dependence. And that is across the board. That is everything from food addiction, sugar addiction to, um, heroin addiction. The addiction is not the same thing as a chemical dependence. So obviously the, one of the biggest arguments against food addiction or even against sugar addiction is that, well, you can't be addicted to food. Your body needs food to live, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, well, what they mean to say is you can't be chemically dependent on food. Um, and and the, to an extent, we all are chemically dependent on food because we need it to live. But that chemical dependence in the sense of your body building up tolerance and then needing it to function normally is not seen in food addiction the same way it is seen in other substance of abuse, such as, you know, nicotine, heroin, tobacco, I'm sorry, nicotine, heroin, cocaine, et cetera. Um, I want to be explicitly clear that there is a difference between those two things. Um, and that's not an opinion that's actually like clinical definitions. Um, and just for some background, like most of one, I have two master's degrees and I, one of them is actually in neuropharmacology surrounding drugs and abuse. So, um, this is a liter a, a body of literature. I know fairly well. I actually wrote my master's thesis on the addictive properties of fat and sugar compared to cocaine. Um, so, that was a while ago and I did have to do more research to kind of like refresh myself. But again, this is just kind of a, a field of study I'm very familiar with. Um, and it's not my personal opinion. It is what the data and the literature says. Um, so chemical dependence is what it sounds like. Your body is dependent on a chemical. Um, that can be something like nicotine, alcohol, cocaine, what have you. Um, obviously we're all dependent on food to a certain extent, but as I'll get to later, Food does not have the capacity to change our brain chemistry in quite the same way that other drugs of abuse do. Um, to be honest, even SSRIs, so like antidepressants, change your brain chemistry and you start to increase tolerance over time. That's why a lot of people notice that like they have to keep increasing their dose of their SSRIs or they go through withdrawals when they come off of their SSRIs because your nervous system has adapted to that chemical. We don't like to think of it like that, but it's that's that is a chemical dependence. Um, so for example, if you think of someone who is an alcoholic, right, that person may start out as like a heavy drinker or even a casual drinker. And then eventually the frequency with which they drink um, and the intensity with which they drink, and the volume that they drink escalates to a point such that their body has regulated to feel having alcohol on board as normal and not having alcohol on board as a withdrawal. So then they kind of to, to feel normal, they continue to drink. Um, and, and then they end up chemically dependent on alcohol. That is different than addiction. Um, and I want to explain to you what I mean. So the chemical dependent dependence is the physical phenomenon. The addiction is the behavior. Okay. So the physical phenomenon is where your body gets accustomed to having this thing on board all the time. The behavior is pursuing that thing despite the negative consequences it may have in your life. So this is where Addic food addiction can become real. Chemical dependence on food outside of the fact that we like all need food to survive, not a real thing because food doesn't have the capacity to change our brain chemistry. I'm going to get to all that in a minute. So just hold tight if you're like, but it does. Hold on. I, I will explain. 
Um, but the behavior component of it, the behavior component of, you know, having rituals surrounding food preparation or food, you know, obtaining food. I hear lots of people who are food addicts um, say that, you know, like going through the fast food line, like fantasizing about what they're going to order, ordering it all, even though they know and eating it all, even though they know it's going to make them sick, it's going to, you know, perpetuate their weight gain. It's going to, you know, in some way cause physical harm to their body. They do it anyway. A lot of times it causes financial damage because they're spending so much money eating out. Um, a lot of times, it's, you know, sabotaging relationships and things like that. So like, those are the types, those are addictive behaviors. It's just that there are negative consequences to this behavior. And I'm continuing it in spite of those things, in spite of my knowledge of those things. Right. And that's kind of where drug addiction, I think the lines get blurred because people associate that chemical dependence with the behavior. And to an extent, it's true. People, you know, if you're getting sick because you don't have, you know, an opiate, um, you're going to be more likely to pursue that opiate. That said, it's still a separate decision. A lot of people, in particular with heroin, they talk about, again, that ritualization of like setting up the spoon, setting up the needle, like getting it all laid out. Um, people with cocaine, again, like cutting their lines and things like that. Um, there's lots of ritualization. And again, it's kind of, you know, we know logically that there is that this is a problem, that it, that it's, you know, wreaking havoc financially on you, that it's destroying friendships and relationships, that it's, you know, maybe compromising your health in some way. It may have already compromised your job, but we, and we know, you know, logically that there is a solution in terms of like rehab and treatment options and things like that, but we're still choosing to do it. And I don't mean to sound like that addiction is not a disease. It is, but it's in a disease in the sense that like things like schizophrenia or depression or anxiety and things like that are a disease the behaviors are reflective of the disease but they are still behaviors they're not just based on the chemical dependence i hope that makes sense um so i want i want to be kind of clear on all on all of those things um and again i don't want to undermine anyone who feels that they're truly addicted to sugar i would argue or encourage you to at least consider that that may not be a true addiction to sugar so much as it is a food addiction with kind of a preference for sugary things um, because food addiction kind of runs the gamut. Um, and that's kind of gets us into the next part, which is how, how does food actually affect their brain chemistry, right? Um, so we do know that food affects our dopamine system. So dopamine is the neurotransmitter that is responsible for like pleasure, reward seeking. Um, and it's all of the things, right? And, and like, Anybody who's ever eaten food knows that like it makes you fucking happy, right? Like it's just, <laughs> that is common, right? And like, if we think about evolutionarily why that might be, um, yeah, it makes sense that like, you know, food makes us happy. We need food to live. So therefore it encourages us and reinforces like, hey, food, good, go get more food because like, that's what we need to survive, right? It also makes logical sense that certain foods such as foods high in sugar and high in fat in particular actually increase dopamine more compared to foods that are not high in fat and not high in sugar. Um, that said, I want to be explicitly clear that no food raises your dopamine levels to the extent of cocaine. No food raises your dopamine levels to the extent of heroin. No food raises your dopamine levels to the extent of nicotine or alcohol. They are, uh, they are tenfold different. It raises dopamine, yes. It is the same neurotransmitter, yes. It is not the same effect. That has never been the case. Popular media got a hold of some rat study somewhere that said sugar raised dopamine and then like turned the narrative around to make it sound like sugar is as addictive as a cocaine. It is simply not. And that it was never true. It was never published in the literature as true. It is just simply a misinterpretation and misrepresentation by mass media. And it's frankly irresponsible because that is what has led to this whole fear mongering narrative around sugar, around added sugars, about how problematic sugar is for us. Uh, when the, the reality is sugar isn't, you know, in moderate doses, sugar is fine. Even in high doses, it's not addictive. It's just simply high in calorie and, and low in any other nutrient. Um, so I think, you know, I want to be explicitly clear that like, yes, sugar and, and other foods too. I also want to be clear that it's not just sugar. It's, it's high fat foods too. And I think out, we know that, right? We, we know that intuitively that when you eat a piece of pie or when you eat French fries, like 
you feel happy chemicals more than you do when you eat a salad. You may want to choose a salad all other times for other reasons, but like we know that like certain foods hit our pleasure centers differently. I don't think that that is like breaking any, any, you know, preconceptions here. Um, and I also think it's important to, to know that that's normal, right? Like that's, and we think about it evolutionarily, it makes sense because the foods that, you know, evolutionarily we had to hunt and gather for our food, which means we had to spend energy to get energy, right? So what did we want to do? We wanted to spend the least amount of energy because again, food was scarce at this point in time. It's not so much in our world now, but again, we evolved when it was, and it's only been the last maybe century that food has been highly accessible to, to all humans. And even then there's some room for debate, but we'll, we'll say that for now. So to be clear, we wanted to expend the least amount of energy possible for the most energy that we could get in return. So it makes sense that like those pleasure seeking pathways are going to be hit the hardest by foods that are the highest in calories that are going to give us the most nutrients back for our efforts. They're going to quite literally reward us the most physiologically in terms of nourishing us, but also mentally, right? Like mother nature is not stupid. We, this stuff happens for a reason. So foods that are, and that, that is foods that are high in fat and foods that are high in sugar, even salty foods too, because salty foods, the argument there is that salty foods are probably safer, um, just because they meant that they had been preserved, but that's again, just a theory, but it makes sense, right? So I think it's, I think it's important to understand that like, you know, it's, the fact that we feel pleasure around these foods is not uncommon. Now, what I think can happen in some cases, and I think this is true for most cases of addiction period, not just food addiction, is that there are some individuals, whether it is like a genetic thing or like a product of trauma or what have you, that your brain chemistry, and I don't, I don't mean to say you're in terms of like, othering other people. What I mean is just that like, there are certain people whose brain chemistry has been altered as such that they either feel those pleasures more pronounced or they don't last as long and they need to kind of reaffirm it more often, if that makes sense. So what we see in certainly the drug abuse literature is that, you know, and I think again, we know this rationally is that many people drink alcohol, not everybody becomes an alcoholic. Um, and, and even people who at one point in their life had a, a normal, safe relationship with alcohol can suddenly not have a healthy or safe relationship with alcohol. And that comes down to just variations at the individual level. What exactly those variations are, I'll be completely frank with you, we don't yet know. There are some theories out there about genetics, and I think most of us kind of know that alcoholism in particular can kind of run in families, but I think any of us, you know, our brains are hugely susceptible to events and environment. So at any point in our life, traumatic events can change things for us. Um, certainly traumatic events that occur while our brain is in kind of its formative phase, kind of in those early childhood, adolescent years, um, those scenes can change the way your brain is wired. It basically changes how your body produces and responds to stimuli and that can change your response to various things that would affect your dopamine, including drugs, alcohol, and food. Um, so I think that in many cases of food addiction, it may start as a way to cope. A lot of times that is deeply rooted in trauma. Um, and that, that's not to say that is always the case, but it, it can be, um, there can also be like turning points or traumatic events that can turn an otherwise healthful relationship with food into one that is not. Um, so I think it's, it's important to recognize that that happens across the board. And I think Unfortunately, I think a lot of people want to think that it's something that we can control and that it's not a disease because they don't want to believe that it could happen to them when the reality is it could. And we don't know enough genetically to predict whether or not it will happen to you. And honestly, even if we did, there's all kinds of unforeseen circumstances out there that could change your brain chemistry that we have no way of predicting. Um, so it could just easily be you um, or me or anybody. Um, and I think that's a, a reality that's really scary for people. So instead we would rather just like blame it on the sugar. Um, and the, the fact is it's not the sugar, <laughs> right? Sugar has been around for a long time. It's been a part of the human diet 
for forever. Um, and you know, I also want to be clear that like sugar is sugar. It doesn't like all sugar comes from plants. There's no such thing as like natural and versus refined versus processed sugars. I did another podcast on that. So I don't want to spend too much time on it here, but I think a lot of the narrative, again, trying to push this narrative that it's like the sugar's problem, not just a hard reality is that, you know, like it's, it's the way we've changed the sugar. We haven't changed sugar. Like sugar has been literally the same coming from sugar cane at this point for centuries. And even before that, I mean, it was coming from other things. Like it's sugar has been processed and concentrated by humans for like millennia at this point. Um, like people, like even tribes back in like nomad ages, they would like boil down fruits and stuff like that to like gather the sap and stuff like that and preserve them for longer. Like We've been doing this for a long time. There is no difference in the sugars of today and the sugars of yesterday. Yes, we do need more of it. I will say that. Is that impacting our health? I don't know, but it's also not an addictive substance. It's just something that we now have more readily access to, thanks to modernization. Um, so in terms of kind of, you know, what, what actually does happen with our brain chemistry, um, a lot of the studies about sugar addiction, as with everything, are in rats. Um, so, and again, when we try to translate, and again, that's not uncommon for most health, you know, phenomena to start out in rodents, because obviously there's things we can do to rodents that we can't do to humans. Um, and there's also variables that we control in rodents that we can't control in humans. Um, so yes, in rat studies, we will see rats like, you know, press levers for sweet trees or press levels for sugar. We do see that their dopamine levels rise. We see human dopamine levels rise. But what we don't see is the same level of um, what's called impulsivity as rats do for things like cocaine. They don't become adapted to sugar. They don't become, you know, like fervent trying to get sugar. Because rats will actually starve themselves for cocaine. Like if they have an option between food and cocaine, they're going to go cocaine all the time, out every time. Um, and with sugar, if it's like sugar versus a pellet, they'll kind of be bopped between the two. Maybe preferentially they'll do a little bit more sugar. But like, again, we know that sugar does increase dopamine more. Makes sense, right? Um, we also know that like any kind of like fervent type behavior in rat studies is also based on restriction. So like if rats, rats are smart, they're not smarter than you think they are. Um, they know that like they only get sugar during that two hour window. So they'll ignore their pellets for the two hour they know they get sugar. Again, that's adaptive. It makes sense, right? Like rats are wired the same way humans are that like it's the biggest benefit for the least amount of expenditure. If they're going to get more calories from the sugar, that to them in survival mode is a good thing. Um, and, but then they also know that like the pellets will be there all day long. Um, if you take away that restriction factor, again, they'd be bopped between the two. They're kind of like, oh yeah, I'll do some sugar now and then I'll go eat some pellets. Like it, they don't seem to care all that much for the difference. Um, so I want to be clear that like, that's what the rat studies actually show. Um, anybody that claims that they like, you know, push levers as much as they do for cocaine, like that's just not true. It, it, they don't. <laughs> I, I built a whole thesis trying to prove that they do and they didn't. Um, and, and, and none of the studies that are, that are out there said that they did either. Um, what we do find in humans, as we almost always do, a lot of those effects go away um, because humans are just infinitely more complex. Um, I've talked about this before, but um, humans, we live very different lives from each other compared to rats who are in a cage in the same building, in the same room, held at the same temperature, same amount of light, same amount of dark, um, same amount of water every day, like same relative activity level, like same stress level, like, you know, of all of those variables are constant then like, yeah, you're going to see much clearer data. Anytime we go into humans, all of that goes out the window because we have different lives. We have different jobs. We might have kids. We might not, we might, um, you know, be different ages. We might have different stress levels. We might have access to different other foods outside of the study. Um, so, you know, it, we're going to see a lot less clear clarity and that's okay. Like that's, that's the goal, right? Um, there are fMRI studies that do show that, you know, sugar lights up the same dopamine pathways as, as drugs of abuse, similar to rats, similar to everything else we've seen. It is not to the same extent as, as drugs of abuse. It, it, it lights up the same pathways, not with the same intensity. Um, so I think that's kind of, um, that's kind of the big discrepancy there. And, um, 
And again, even in like human behavioral research, we see a lot more of that like binging type behavior around sugar and, and honestly really anything when you add a component of restriction to it. So if you put people on a no sugar diet for three months and then show them sugar, they're going to go nuts. If you have them introduced to it, you know, little bits every day, they're not going to care that much when they're, they're introduced to a whole lot. So I think, and this is kind of where I want to sink my teeth in just a little bit. I think so much of what we have tried to do as a society is blame sugar and blame our own inability to control ourselves around it. When the reality is sugar is something that's always been part of our diet. It's natural that we want it and seek it and restricting it from ourselves is actually the thing that makes us crave it more. Again, this is different from a food addiction. I want to be clear on that again. Um, but I want to, you know, when it comes to people saying that they're like, you know, craving sugar and stuff like that, that's usually because you haven't had enough to eat. Um, whether it's not, you haven't had enough sugar, you haven't had enough anything. Um, usually you just haven't had enough. And that restriction factor is what tends to promote. And I've talked about this again, over and over and over again on this podcast is that the act of restriction is what promotes binge like behavior. And that goes to somebody who has true binge eating disorder, but it also goes to someone who just feels like they are a bottomless pit at the end of the day because they just haven't eaten enough throughout the day. Um, so again, it's that restriction that leads to the binge. Now that is different from food addiction. I will be very, very clear on that. But again, food addiction kind of is, is a separate thing. It has this ritualization. It's um, it's not, a lot of times actually not really specific foods. It may be like a specific like restaurant or food brand or like certain kind of hubs, but it's not just like sugar. Um, so I think it's, I think it's really important to recognize that like a lot of this fear mongering and stuff like that is just, honestly, it's, it's a lay media whether in, I, I don't want to put the intentionality on anybody because I don't believe that a lot of people that push this narrative have actually intended to cause harm. I believe that what they wanted to do was sell their story and they use sens sensationalized headlines to do it. Um, and should that be that way? I don't know. Um, is it irresponsible? In my opinion, yes. But I also can kind of understand it. Um coming from like a health and wellness standpoint, I think it's irresponsible and dangerous, but I also don't know that that was the intention. I don't think they understood enough about it to understand the harm that they're causing. Um, and then you have, you know, supplement companies and food companies, you know, basically trying to like rewire their marketing to fit this narrative that now people have. And it just kind of leads to this perpetual fear mongering around sugar. Um, sugar is not addictive, at least at this particular juncture in time, we have no reason to believe that it it is an addictive substance. It is certainly nowhere near um, drugs of abuse, even though food addiction isn't, in, in my opinion, a real thing. Um, and it's a real disease. I believe that that is very separate um, and typically not related to one particular food. Um, and again, I, I say all of this is like, this is the research that we have now. This is what it says. If your lived experience is different or contradicts that, I believe you. I don't mean to, to tell you that you're wrong. I just mean to tell you that the research in the samples that we have and the studies that we've done don't reflect a broad general trend. Are there people who may still fit that mold? Yeah, that's very possible. Um, and we just haven't done enough research to understand that yet or who kind of that population is. But like I said, even, you know, most people eat food and don't become addicted. A lot of people can drink alcohol and don't become addicted. Um, a lot of people honestly use like cocaine and opiates and don't become fully addicted to them. So I think it's, it stands to your reason that there may still be a subset of the population that could be addicted to sugar or other things. We just, the research we have now does not support that theory. And it's certainly not something that occurs on a population level um, as the lay media would have you believe. Um, so that's on food addiction. I'm sorry, sugar addiction. Goodness. Um, I will be back next time with more fun updates for you all. In the meantime, check out the cauldron and check out the, um, the workshop that's coming up on food prep and how to, how to basically like conceptualize and like how to feed yourself as an adult. All right. You all have a great rest of your day and I will see you next time.